So I'm Dan Cisleano. I'm the faculty director of the Rock Center for Corporate Governance. Thanks for coming and welcome to the seventh annual Morrison and Forrester Lecture in honor of Marshall Small. Um, I want to just give a special welcome to uh, Marshall and Mary Small. They're sitting up here and uh, frankly Marshall Small needs no introduction. He is truly uh, one of the founding fathers of corporate governance and uh, perhaps more importantly a very good friend of the law school and we're happy to have him here and in the back page of your program you can read a lot about him. I could do no justice to any description of his remarkable contributions over the last many decades to law, Bay Area, Morrison Forrester and the law school. So welcome and thank you for being with us this evening. Um, I have a... I also want to thank the firm of Morrison and Forrester for uh, endowing and sponsoring this lecture on an annual basis um, and specifically, specifically acknowledge uh, Keith uh, Wetmore, who's the firm chair of Morrison and Forrester. There are several partners here from Morrison and Forrester and a couple of associates, I see some. So uh, welcome all of you. I'm glad you're here. Uh, and again, we are very grateful for the generous gift that makes this annual lecture uh, possible. Um, I'm here to introduce, though, Kevin Warsh. Uh, he, I, I, before I give the introductions, I want to give you my ultimate litmus test for speakers uh, at the law school, particularly with the Rock Center. So the reality is that faculty at Stanford Law School are extraordinarily busy. And they're of an age, on average, in which they have kids at home, they've got projects to do, consulting to do. And so my litmus test is whether or not you manage to turn out faculty for an event when you come and speak. And so there are several people who do that. There's Daryl Duffy at the Business School and others. Well, I am really pleased that Kevin Warsh, so it's the ultimate indication to me that all the stuff I'm about to say must be true, <laughs> he manages to turn out almost a row and a half of faculty sitting back there. Uh, so I don't mean to embarrass them, but uh, it's a who's who of our own corporate governance sect, and they're here to listen to him, which uh, tells me that he is all that, and here's some of that. So first, um, he currently serves as the Distinguished Visiting Fellow at the Hoover Institution uh, and a lecturer at the Graduate School of Business. Uh, he received his BA from the correct school, that is to say Stanford, and he got his JD from the other one, uh, Harvard, but that's okay. Um, his lecture tonight is going to be real regulatory reform, a practitioner's perspective. Uh, he promises to answer as many questions as we can possibly fit in. Um, Governor Warsh, and I'll explain why I say Governor Warsh, served as a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System from February 2006 until April of 2011. Uh, Warsh served as the Federal Reserve's representative to the Group of 20, the G20, and as the board's emissary to the emerging and advanced economies in Asia. In addition, he was an administrative governor, uh, which means he managed and oversaw the board's operations, personnel, and financial performance. Something you probably don't know about him was that in 2009, Fortune magazine named him one of the best 40 under 40 of the nation. Um, prior to his appointment of the board, from 2002 until 2006, he served as special assistant to the president for economic policy and also executive sector, secretary of the White House National Economic Council. Previously, he was a member of the mergers and acquisitions department of Morgan Stanley in New York, serving as vice president and executive director. And he practiced law for 14 weeks, give or take, uh, <laughs> as a summer associate, but is evidence that some folks, when they do that law and economics curriculum in law school, they veer a little bit more towards the economics and a little bit less towards the law, not to say that he hasn't put it to great use. So with that, I would like to welcome Kevin Warsh to the podium. Thank you. Okay. So Dan, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, Marshall and Mary, thank you very much for hosting along with uh, uh, your fellow partners at Morrison and Forrester. Um, I will say it's a pretty intimidating to be here at Stanford Law School, uh, to be somehow opining on the state of regulatory law and the regulatory reform agenda in front of this many esteemed lawyers. And while it is true I only spent 14 weeks in the law, they were a high quality 14 weeks. This was not a summer associate where I was just walking around going to lunch and meeting partners afterwards for drinks. I probably worked six, seven hours a day for those 14, <laughs> 14 weeks. And uh, as I said to a few people before we got started, I really do think that my legal training, my exposure to the law, end up in some sense making me a better regulator. Now, I would never have claimed to have been an expert on banking or securities law uh, from those 14 weeks, but of observing the system both as a regulator, as a policymaker, and at least over the course of the last 12 months, perhaps, as an observer, uh, I wanted to address the crowd today with my views uh, 
Now, there are a lot of people that will come before you and say Dodd-Frank is terrific law, and others that will say Dodd-Frank is terrible. I think there are few, too few perhaps, who will come before you and say Dodd-Frank risks the following bad things, but there is an alternative. The alternative isn't going back to the law as it was before this bill was put in place. So what I'm going to try to do tonight is a little bit frame the issues, try to define what Dodd-Frank perhaps is doing in effect, if not in intent, and to set the scene for how real reform could still be accomplished. I would say given the thousands of pages of rule writings, regulations that will be put forth over the course of the next 18 months from the Federal Reserve and the FDIC, the new Financial Stability Oversight Council, it's not too late. We're still at a point where improvements can be made so at the end of the day, we end up with a dynamic competitive banking system. In my view, the risk of Dodd-Frank is that we end up with the opposite. We end up with a banking system with several oligopolistic institutions atop the financial sector that makes it increasingly difficult for regional banks, community banks, and small banks to do what they have long done in the US, which is compete some win, some lose, and provide real credit to the real economy. So that's our objective. I'll see what I can accomplish out of that over the course of the next half hour or so. And I'll try to give this framework, then also give an example in something that they call Chapter 14. So thank you very much for having me. There's no question going into the financial crisis that many practitioners, myself included, did not have as much uh, sense of what would transpire in the deepest, darkest days of the financial crisis. So the idea that there needs to be comprehensive fundamental regulatory reform after being subjected to the financial crisis should be apparent. But at core, I worry that the Dodd-Frank Act might be no equal to that task. As currently envisioned, it strikes me that the Dodd-Frank Act is premised on a pretty simple notion that if we only have more regulators from more agencies with more funding, more power, and more discretion, bad things won't happen. That enhanced regulatory discipline alone, more exacting checklists for the Federal Reserve's regulators, more oversight from a new oversight council, and more boots on the ground. So instead of sending X number of regulators to a big, large bank in New York every day, we send two or three X. If that's all that's necessary, then the focus on regulatory discipline alone is right. If that theory has it right, next time will indeed be different. I think my experience at the Fed, though, tells me that's not right. So I don't, my experience, I think, informs my judgments that you'll hear about in three ways. First, my former colleagues that were banking regulators and supervisors are high integrity, highly competent folks who are trying to do the right thing. Second, the business of banking can thrive with clear rules of the road so long as it doesn't discriminate against any class of firms or any function. And third, maybe most important, any kind of oversight that leaves the burden of regulation on supervision on regulators alone to the exclusion of two other pillars of prudential supervision, which the students here have no doubt learned in their class, is likely to disappoint us. So the focus has been on regulatory discipline in Dodd-Frank. We need more of them, more regulators. So the way I would say it simply is we've doubled down on regulatory discipline. We've given up on market discipline under the theory that you know markets, markets must be run by greedy speculators and they'll never tell us anything. We've given up on that. And we've outsourced the third pillar of prudential supervision, which are capital standards. We've outsourced that to uh, a committee of well-intentioned bureaucrats from around the world who meet in Switzerland with a theory of what should be the capital for the world's international banks. We need all three pillars back. We need these pillars to be complementary to each other. So if regulators miss something, markets can remind them. If markets miss something, we'll have real capital at the core of our financial institutions as a sort of insurance policy to make sure that we don't find ourselves back into a financial panic. But I'm worried that market discipline and capital standards have been relegated 
instead of revived. And at core, what I'll discuss is that neither capital rules nor effective market discipline can be made operative when the largest US institutions are deemed too big to fail. Now, Dodd-Frank says they're taking care of that. They're ending too big to fail. But in practice, these large institutions are viewed as too big to fail, and that is perceived to be uh, de facto the government's policy. The window of opportunity to fix this, so again, we have a competitive banking system, is upon us, and I'm afraid if we miss it in the next year or 18 months, we will end up with a banking system that looks more like the banking system of many of our uh, trading partners around the world, a banking system that looks like Japan's or Germany's or France's. Now, it's, these are not, it's not my point to, to denigrate how they choose to run their banking systems, where they've got large banks that are in some sense sanctioned and supported by the sovereign. That's their judgment. But I don't think that's how we've run our banking system. I don't think that's how we've provided credit to our economy. And so as a result, I don't think that's the model we should be choosing today. In addition, having sort of walked through this framework, I'll talk a bit, as I mentioned, about an amendment to the bankruptcy code. An amendment which would effectively mean that clearer, tougher, and more assured treatment of stakeholders in large banks needs to be known and understood prior to the onset of distress. And if market participants believe that there was a provision of the bankruptcy code that could take one of these large firms that was struggling, take it out of harm's way, resolve it, and losses be shared by shareholders and creditors, then I think we could potentially eradicate too big to fail and have the kind of dynamic competitive banking system that I think is really core to re-energize not just our banking system, but the broader US economy. And the risk, I'm afraid, is if we don't do that, we will have these quasi-public utilities uncomfortably between government and the private sector atop the financial sector, and that our government, increasingly short of fiscal space, will put itself in the position of directing policy through these institutions. So now I want to spend a little time on the second pillar, which I don't think has been given proper attention in Dodd-Frank, or at least the right attention. And it's a pillar that should stand up if regulatory discipline and regulators were to miss things, and that's capital standards. So the capital regime that's coming out of Dodd-Frank and coming out of international discussion strikes me as suffering from a few infirmities each of which I'm afraid runs the risk of undermining this pillar from being successful. So first, the world's banking regulators meet all the time in Basel, Switzerland. They are hard at work at implementation of what they call Basel III, the new banking standard for capital that should govern the world's largest and most interconnected banks. It's a worthwhile objective, it's a noble framework, but I think it suffers from a few critical flaws. First, as I mentioned, the banking model of many of those with whom we're negotiating is fundamentally different than our own. So if they perhaps have institutions that don't need as much capital, is they've got their government that is explicitly standing behind them. So if we're to come to some common agreement as to what capital should be, we should recognize that they're solving for the continuation of a few dominant firms in each of their country and we should be solving for something quite different. In addition, many of those countries that go to Switzerland and meet at these international G20 bodies to discuss what capital standards should be, in many of those countries, they don't have a too big to fail problem for their banks. They've got banks that are too big for country. So if you think about the relative assets, the amount of uh, exposure that's being underwritten by certain governments, then it is probably true, markets have this right. These governments can't afford to let them fail because the governments would fail. So we're not negotiating with people that have the same objectives, perhaps. And again, I don't mean to say their objectives are wrong, I just mean to say they're different. This makes, I think, a robust global capital accord very problematic, very hard to pull off, especially if we think about the world we're in, in Europe, I think even European regulators would say that the European banks are grossly undercapitalized, and I would say the European economy is re-entering recession. 
Now this capital accord is supposed to have a series of implementation dates between now and final implementation in 2019. So it's going to change because fundamentally the global economy will look different 12 and 24 and 36 months out. So there is still, I think, a window of opportunity amid those changes to have it change for the better. I think a second concern of mine with respect to the Basel process, which again I think is a noble and worthwhile objective, is to look at what happened to Basel I and Basel II. These were the first iterations over the last dozen years at a global capital accord. The results of those discussions ended up with a standard that was so complex, so opaque, that it was impossible for market participants or fellow regulators to really judge what was what. As a result, I think firms could not see how they stood versus their peers. Market participants couldn't say, I like this bank because of their capital, but I'm uncomfortable with that one because of the opacity of the ultimate standards. As a result, I would say regulatory capital is a far less reliable bulwark against economic weakness than old fashioned capital, which is shareholders capital that can absorb real losses. Now the Basel process is not to worry, Come 2015, they'll have a standard for that as well. But among all the largest banks in the world, they're scrambling to figure out their new business models. And so rather than following this process, it strikes me that the US and a coalition of the willing that want dynamic competitive banking sectors, that want banks to internalize their costs of capital, that we should work to achieve that. One third, uh, one final problem strikes me with the capital regime as it's now being uh, put into place. The way you learn capital in your banking regulation class is you said, well, capital was there to ensure safety and soundness. Well, not anymore. Under the new framework coming out of legislation here in the US, but matched by many countries around the world, capital has another uh, objective. In some sense, the legislation recognizes you're gonna have these very large firms that may in fact be too big to fail, but it says, don't worry, we can compensate for that by adding an extra couple percentage points of capital. That'll be leveling the playing field. As a direction, I think it's a helpful direction, but it is clearly second best to having a dynamic competitive banking system. So if you look at the US, you would say, well, we've always had big banks. We had big banks in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and I'd say, yeah, you've had it. But bigness isn't badness. Many of those large banks are no longer with us. So there would be a churn among those. During much of this period, we had three tiers of financial institutions, very large banks, some regional institutions, and thousands and thousands of community banks. I'm afraid where we are now is we'll take those three tiers and we will memorialize them forever. If you happen to be a big, too big to fail bank right now, congratulations. It could be that you will be in that privileged position forever. This is not a competitive banking system. And it strikes me this is a window of opportunity to stop it. So instead of this, we should begin with a first best foundation, with a strong, simple, transparent set of capital standards that are appropriate for a competitive dynamic banking system. So investors and regulators can see real capital, know it can absorb real losses, and investors can see who's the strongest and who's the weakness and make their own judgments, rather than go down this path that we're currently on. So we talked about regulatory discipline, I think, being important with much to be improved upon. I think we talked a little bit about how capital standards are on a path that worries me. What about the third pillar, market <laughs> discipline? I'm afraid market discipline has been cast aside in the debate in the US and many countries around the world. Market discipline should be there to provide regulators early indications of what's around the corner, what's over the mountain, because regulators can't do this alone. We need markets to tell us where problems are. Well, how would they do that? If they had access to real information by our firms, large and small, then they could start to internalize this information and make judgments. Market prices should reveal much about their standing. They should help discipline the behavior of firms by repricing funding costs. 
and stakeholders should be able to use market prices to evaluate where they want to put their money. But market discipline can only work if we empower investors. The Federal Reserve's most recent stress test tried to provide some more information about the state of individual banks. But where most investors look for their knowledge of the banking sector is to the periodic filings at the Securities and Exchange Commission. If you were to pour through the voluminous documents of our largest banks, and I've been in this business now for 20 years on all sides, I could go through these documents for hours and hours and still not fundamentally understand how much real capital they have to offset real losses, how much real liquidity they have to, to guard against a run, and what their real financial condition is. That's unacceptable. We need a fundamental review, a fundamental change in the SEC's uh, transparency so that risks of large, complex financial institutions are known not just by a small cadre of regulators who figure out how to ask the right questions, but by market participants. So in recent days, what do you see? Some days all the banks are up. It's a risk on day. Other days all the banks are down. It's a risk off day. What we need for a strong banking system is to have banks differentiate themselves. And it shouldn't be based on some breathless headline from some government official. It's because investors would be able to do their own homework. So one exercise just to practice on. Look at the financial statements of a large consumer products company. Pick your favorite, Walmart or JCPenney or anyone else. Go right to their financial statements. In about 20 minutes, you can understand their profitability, their margins, their capital, their liquidity, and their competitive position. You can't do that with our banking sector. So that is our obligation in the official sector to try to make market discipline come alive. But even if that information were far improved and better, what would we do now? Market discipline at this moment in 2012 might still be unable to exert the kind of discipline that I talked about. Repeated government interventions during the past several years. Some of you might think those, invent those interventions were advisable. Some might think they were a poor idea. But markets saw a set of policy preferences. Market participants have largely come to a judgment that with a handful of firms, no matter what the government says, the government's got their back. This strikes me as unacceptable. Expectations have hardened that governments will come to the rescue of large firms. The result is a banking system in which the government's support is even more assured. These lessons must be unlearned and unlearned soon. If not, this market discipline that I've talked about will never be operative. Our largest firms must be able to persuade regulators that their failure would not endanger the financial markets and would not endanger the economy. And in my view, some of our largest banks will survive this scrutiny. Others will not. The scale and scope of those firms that fail this simple test um, will have to be diminished. And if that's the case, that's not something we as policymakers, as market participants, as academics should run from, it's something we should embrace. Those interconnected firms that find themselves dependent on the government support do not serve our economy's interests. Their existence shouldn't be countenanced, and the risks should not be underwritten by taxpayers. There were a few of us who were long worried about Fannie and Freddie's failures before they ultimately failed and had to be rescued by the government. I cannot think of a compelling reason why those of us that were worried about Fannie and Freddie being too big to fail shouldn't have similar worries about some of our largest banks. If it wasn't right for Fannie and Freddie, it shouldn't be right for the rest of them. And I'm still of the view that many of our largest firms would thrive in this environment without the backstop of government support, without being micromanaged uh, year in and year out, but allowed to compete, win business, and lose. So eradicating the notion of these too big to fail firms is the essential piece to bring about real reform. Now some progress has been made by the FDIC, some progress has been made by the Fed in trying to bring out this information, but there have been a lot of steps going the other direction. 
We don't call these firms too big to fail firms in Washington anymore. We call them SIFIs, systemically important financial institutions. We shouldn't be fooled. When the government says that one small class of institutions are different from the rest, markets have it figured out that that's the class that they feel that their credit and their exposure is backed by our government. So signaling to markets that it, the government is somehow vested in a few firm survival strikes me as bad for the government, bad for the banks, and as I said, most important, bad for the economy. So with that framework, which is really a three-pillar framework instead of what I fear is Dodd-Frank's one-pillar framework, where each of these pillars compensate for the other because none of them are perfect. You might hear people come before you and say, markets are always right. We don't need any regulators. You might hear others come before you and say, you know, regulators, if they just had more power, they're always going to be right. And markets don't have anything to, to share or help us with. Neither of those views can be right. We need both of them and capital to work together. And I don't know whether it's a polarized Washington or the fear of the panic, but we've given up on this three-pillar approach. Now, there's no panacea to it. I've given some examples of way reforms can be made. Let me give one more example of a well-intended reform that could help rid us of this too big to fail. And after this, I'll be happy to take your questions. Now, when the regulatory reform debate began, you heard every member of Congress say the purpose here is to make sure that that bailing out will never happen again. Well, somewhere between those statements and the reality of where we stand in our implementation of Dodd-Frank, we must have gone amiss. Here's one example. In Title II of Dodd-Frank, they established something called the Orderly Liquidation Authority. It is presumably to help resolve failing firms that are determined to pose a systemic risk to financial stability. And there's a process through which this orderly liquidation authority would be used involving the Treasury Secretary, the Federal Reserve, and others. And then extraordinary powers are granted, including the ability to bridge, to obtain bridge funding from the Treasury to preserve franchise value and make sure this firm and this institution, or at least substantial parts of it, can survive. Of note, Dodd-Frank allows the FDIC to make payments to certain creditors as part of this reorganization. So a lot of people look back on the crisis and say, well, wouldn't the orderly liquidation authority have been helpful? And I say in retrospect, it could have been. This sort of authority could have proven useful to my colleagues and me during the crisis. If we'd gone into the crisis with this sort of authority, we might well have had better options to dispose orderly of firms. I suspect that this authority would have been attractive to some, perhaps myself included, but a highly debated alternative. Those favoring its use would have had a more compelling argument. To say this, it, it, we would have had a more compelling argument if we had said that this OLA authority had been the law of the land and understood by markets, so they're not going to be surprised by it. But if this form of liquidation were only a newly established authority in an unpracticed statute, I'm guessing that some of my policymaker friends would have said it's too risky to use. It's untested and untried. So it's not obvious to me. Had this authority existed some years ago, we would be in a, any different place by way of bailing out large institutions. If nothing else, though, this OLA authority could have strengthened our negotiating posture with certain firms who perhaps thought that the government had no alternative and that they would get the benefit of the bargain. But even those that say OLA would have been great a few years ago uh, and it would have mitigated the harm inflicted, even if that's true of wargaming the last crisis, this new grant of discretionary authority is, in my judgment, in no way up to the task going forward. There's no going home again. The status quo ante will no longer do. But why is that? Because giving this, putting this arrow in policymakers' quiver is now insufficient for the challenges ahead. Granting new powers to resolve failing firms in the discretionary hands of regulators is unlikely to drive the market discipline needed to avoid the recurrence of financial crises. The significant discretion built into Dodd-Frank is unlikely to dissuade investors from their learned view 
however debatable it might be, that the government will stand behind the largest banks. Creditors will be protected, they will figure, and they might turn out to be correct. We have to stop fighting the last war. Too often policies are put in place that might well have mitigated the last crisis, but leave policymakers exceptionally vulnerable to the next one. And the reason why at core I don't think it would be up to the task is because investors, they think we blinked last time in the official sector, and they're willing to make a bet that we will blink again and give creditors 100 cents on the dollar. Again, there's no perfect way to solve that market expectation, but let me try one way to help improve it. So some of my uh, uh, new fellow colleagues here at Stanford, who I must admit were my professors 20 years ago when I was a student, and I've been working on a proposition called Chapter 14. A book will be coming out uh, probably in the next several months that will basically say there's no panacea to this, but instead of this discretionary liquidation authority, which no one really knows what it means or how it will be put in place, because there is no case law, there is no precedent, there is no understanding of how various classes of creditors would be treated, well, what if we began with something that markets already understand, and that's the bankruptcy code? What if we took a blank new chapter, a chapter that now is vacant in the bankruptcy code that we call chapter 14? And what if we make chapter 14 an amendment to the code and we make it applicable particularly to financial institutions? Financial institutions, my uh, critics of what I have to say would, would remind, are different. They're not like widget companies. They're not like smaller banks that are in a local community that can be unwound. And so I'd say perhaps so. But let's begin with the 80 or 90% of the law that is understood and modify it only at the margins for this class of institutions. The reason why I have that preference versus starting with a blank sheet of paper and an untested authority is the bankruptcy code brings with it precedent and case law and well understood protocols to provide substantial clarity as to the rights and obligations of each class of stakeholders. It has deep respect for the rule of law without favor or prejudice, and in fact, reliable treatment under the bankruptcy code and respect for the rule of law is what distinguishes our economy from many foreign economies around the world, and it's what attracts capital to our shores. So in my view, a new chapter of the code applicable to all institutions, not just the largest, would bring much needed credibility to the murky issues involving the government support for large firms. A Chapter 14 amendment to the code would go some distance to remind creditors and counterparties that the government has fine and compelling and effective options to unwind a financial firm and in the long run promote financial stability. The benefits would go well beyond establishing this clarity. It would be about ridding markets of too big to fail expectations in the near term. It would be about changing behavior, not principally in bad times when these choices have to be made, but in good times. So market participants, regulators, international counterparties could take proper precautions so that the bad times are in effect less bad. An early assessment of financial uh, firms and vibrant competition among them are far better ways uh, to avoid a recurrence of the financial crisis. We need tougher, clearer, less discretionary measures, including invoking Chapter 14, and that would make a substantial improvement over current law. So let me end with, well, what if Chapter 14 were available to policymakers alongside this existing authority? What if we amended the Dodd-Frank Act with this one change? Would that make a difference? And that is an idea that was debated in Congress before Dodd-Frank was signed into law by the president. Well, my view would be to achieve meaningful benefits, Chapter 14 would have to be understood as the prevailing dominant option. If in investors believe that OLA authority, this new authority with all the confusion associated with it, were more likely to be used than what I describe as the tough love under the bankruptcy code, the benefits would quickly dissipate. Ultimately, I suspect my preference for Chapter 14 versus some newfangled liquidation authority is based in part on a strong bias. The existence of these large quasi-public utilities, 
atop the financial sector is growth defeating to the U.S. economy. Those that prefer OLA authority, to be fair to them, put greater emphasis on wanting to preserve optionality and flexibility going into the next crisis. But I'm more willing to constrain discretion, return to clear rules-based oversight regimes that relies on real capital, real market forces, and real discipline. In so doing, it strikes me the U.S. will have a stronger, more dynamic, and competitive banking system that would serve the interests of consumers, businesses, and the broader economy. With that, I'd be happy to uh, pause, take your questions on the subject of regulation, reform, and uh, anything else that might be on your mind. We have about 15 minutes for questions. The only thing I ask is that, not because we can't hear you, but because we want to capture on video, is that you come up to one of the microphones and go ahead and ask your questions. Do you have any questions? <laughs> we have one. Thank you. This this was very illuminating, and and, I, and the question I had was about the Chapter 14 proposal. Um, you know, uh, commentators on bankruptcy also have this uh, debate going on as to whether there's too much discretion in the bankruptcy code or whether it isn't rigid enough. I was wondering if you could uh, uh, elaborate a little bit about your thoughts about how to structure Chapter 14 in order to contain the discretion. And the contrast really is, uh, or a comparison might be, to the GM and Chrysler cases where they went through bankruptcy, but really it was a government-controlled process. And GM and Chrysler were similarly too big to fail. And bankruptcy law just did not, you know, did not establish uh, uh, strict enough rules to prevent the government from basically determining the conclusion of that case. In retrospect, it may be that the government was right in that case, but how would in the future, how would Chapter 14 prevent the government from becoming similarly involved with a large financial institution where there were lots of jobs and lots of consequences at stake? Right. Thank you. So, so a couple of points. Um, first, my affection for Chapter 14 is in part about the resolution of the firm in extremis, in the darkest case. And if I were to compare a Chapter 14 resolution that has some discretion associated with it, as do uh, bankruptcy cases in the widget business, that is a far less uh, open-ended discretion than in this brand new authority called OLA. But like you, I tend to favor constraining discretion to a large degree and that's because none of these things are principally about how do we handle these things in the 11th hour. What I want is less discretion, more rules, more clarity, so that a firm that is failing is known and understood by market so it doesn't go from being a perfectly solvent institution with regulatory capital that is perfectly strong and the next day being unable to open for business. That's the situation in which we found ourselves a few years ago. So I, uh, I would favor trying to limit the discretion, but even though the bankruptcy code might not be perfect, it is a vast improvement, it strikes me, over where we are. I think some of my fellow colleagues who are writing this book uh, are working through some of the language to see whether it can be tightened. They're also exploring whether or not a special panel of judges, bankruptcy judges, but who would have had exceptional familiarity with financial institutions and the uniqueness of those institutions might make that kind of proceeding uh, clearer, more understood, uh, and that special panel hopefully wouldn't be too busy, but they'd be known and, uh, like in other areas, have a particular expertise because the challenge really will be how long can any of these firms survive in a court of law? And the quicker that dispositions can be made, the larger there is of a residue of assets that can be divided fairly among a proper ranking of creditors. So I don't want to suggest we have an easy answer here, but I do want to suggest that if you begin with the code, as opposed to begin with a blank sheet of paper, you're more likely to drive the market discipline we're looking for. I think most people are, are most familiar with Lehman Brothers, uh, how it went under and how unexpectedly it froze up so many other institutions that were counterparties uh, with the transactions they were involved with. How would Chapter 14, as you see it, have uh, affected the Lehman Brothers and the fallout from that differently? Yeah. So um, 
So that question was asked by a friend, though you wouldn't know it from the difficulty of the question. Um, so, so Buck's question was really about, what about Lehman Brothers and would this be useful? So first, let me give you my own view of the record, which probably diverges from most of the narratives that you read about Lehman Brothers. So it strikes me as though Lehman Brothers has become far more essential to the narrative about the US and global financial crisis than frankly it deserves. This isn't to dismiss the importance of Lehman Brothers, the implications of the failures. But as the Europeans are debating policy now and what to do with certain countries in the periphery, what they say to each other and what certain governments say to them is, don't let country X be your Lehman Brothers. Um, I think the narrative is basically wrong. So if you go back to the financial crisis, at least as I was living it, and I wasn't terribly rested in those days, but preceding Lehman Brothers were a couple of events which tend to be overlooked in this sort of modern narrative. The most consequential is the weekend and two before Lehman Brothers, Fannie and Freddie, which had five and a half trillion dollars of outstanding liabilities. And just to give you some perspective of that number, at the time, the US government had $5.4 trillion in treasuries held in public hands. So these were big assets, big liabilities. And Fannie and Freddie were having not been reformed for the 10 years that preceded it. When Fannie and Freddie's failures were both predicted and predictable, the government had, in my view, at that 11th hour, no choice. The government then ensured that creditors in Fannie and Freddie would get their bait back. It's true, the share prices went almost to zero, but the government stood behind them. Well, the world before that weekend thought that Fannie and Freddie were risk-free assets. They were effectively backed by the government. They might have traded at a minor spread to US treasuries, but I know a lot of foreign central banks that had a lot of this paper. So that weekend, when the Treasury Secretary, in my view, doing almost the only thing that he could do, said, we absolutely stand behind them. Um, by having to make that proclamation, what the world understood is those assets you thought that were risk-free were actually quite risky all the time. So what are the implications of that? Why is that so much more consequential, in my judgment, than Lehman? Coming out of that weekend, these financial markets were so vulnerable. Because if you don't know what a risk-free asset is worth, you're certainly not going to know what a risky asset is worth. So there were no underpinnings of valuation, either in simple corporate finance theory or in practice, going into the famed Lehman weekend. So my view would be, if Lehman had never existed and found its problems, we would have in all likelihood found ourselves in deep, deep problems. Were they made a bit worse by Lehman Brothers? That's, of course, possible. But I think this narrative is really quite confused. Um, secondly, well, what if Chapter 14, having sort of tried to straighten the narrative, what if Chapter 14 were available? Um, I think it would have been very helpful. So the government was left with a few choices. Um, having failed to find a buyer for Lehman Brothers, having all the buyers walked away for reasons of their own choosing, the government was left with an unfortunate choice. Let it fail or come up with some way to provide capital for it. Now, the Federal Reserve, even this Federal Reserve, an incredibly aggressive Federal Reserve, who has found ways to come to the rescue of sectors and money market mutual funds and the rest, we're in the business of providing uh, lending and credit against good assets and we couldn't find them. We could not find good assets to lend against. Now you'll recall that TARP wasn't yet law, whether you like it or not, so the Treasury, they didn't think they had it either. So that's to say there are a couple of bad options. Well, what would Chapter 14 have done? If Chapter 14 had been the law of the land, and everyone from the moment of Bear Stearns in March before September of that year said, boy, these guys are tough. They take these relatively small broker dealers and security firms, and they first subjected Bear Stearns to it. There would have been a real turmoil in financial markets, and people would have said, my expectations are totally different. By the time we'd gotten to fall of that year, they would have adjusted. 
And maybe they would have decided that Lehman Brothers needed more capital and Lehman Brothers might have had seven or eight months to raise more capital. Maybe other buyers would have said, this is an opportunity to take it out. So if chapter 14 had been the law of the land and long the law of the land, not the weekend before, it strikes me not only Lehman Brothers might have been different, but so too might Bear Stearns. Other questions? I'll ask an authorized question from the microphone. Um, you talked about the difficulty investors have understanding the public disclosures. I think we all un understand that. Could you give an example of information that you think uh, you would require disclosure of that people don't currently now disclose yeah. and that would provide information, but on the other hand, protect banks' legitimate interests in you know, you know, the con makeup of their book? Um, so that it would be at least valuable or feasible to get through. And then on, that's the first question. The second one is um, if it's valuable to investors to know the stuff, whatever you, you suggest, uh, why don't some banks at least disclose it now? Presumably there are some banks that are risky that would like to hide it, but maybe there are other banks that would like to signal to investors we're safe, trust us, and yeah. why wouldn't they disclose it at just a, their own will, free will? So um, uh, these are good and hard questions. Let me take a crack at them. So first, I would say what investors don't, investors don't really understand a couple things. One is they don't have the means to compare one firm to another. So I have a, maybe a cynical view of what makes a good regulator and what makes a good investor. A good regulator doesn't have to be smarter than its regulatee. A good regulator just needs to have seen a couple of dozen firms evaluated best practices and said, I really like the way they do risk management. I really like the way this other guy does liquidity management. Hey, for the rest of you, that's how you're doing it. And if someone says, well, actually, I don't do it that way. I do it a better way. Then that's my new best practice. That's what makes regulators good regulators. They don't have to be geniuses. They don't have to second guess management, but they have to have a broad enough remit so they can compare and contrast and drag people to the best standard. The same thing is true of investors. Investors don't have to have the most detailed understanding of what a tier one common equity ratio should be. They don't need to have a definitive view of how much liquidity the, the bank needs from wholesale or retail funding to stop a run. Because that might be asking a little too much of all investors. But they do need to be able to make a ranking. They do need to be able to compare apples to apples. And if you look at financial statements, I think they fail in two respects. One is there is no common template through which firms can, investors can make a comparable decision. And then even if you're looking only at one firm, it is difficult to judge how any of their descriptions and assets aggregate to a consolidated balance sheet. Now the banks will say, Rob, what you did. If you make me do that, then I will give all my competitive information of what assets I like. And that won't be good for market functioning, because everyone will follow me because I'm perceived to be the smartest at it. Well, I think there's a relatively easy way around that. We don't have to have them delineate QCIP numbers of securities. We don't even have to have them delineate how much of subprime mortgages that are with FICO stores of 740 and below are on their balance sheet. We can bucket these categories in broad enough areas so they can all make whatever competitive judgments they want about what assets they want, but yet there could be categories of home equity loans that compare apples to apples across firms so at least you know what those buckets are. I mean, this isn't that difficult for Walmart and JCPenney. We shouldn't allow the complexity of financial institutions to make it that difficult for us. I mean, one simple way to ask this of yourself is the SEC would say, and there are prominent SEC former commissioners and others here, that the financial disclosures put forth by the SEC should be, and I'll try to paraphrase what a fine securities lawyer would say, should be the risks of the business as seen through the eyes of the board and the senior management team. Well, look at the financial statements of the largest financial institutions, not just in the US, but around the world. That tells me either that those board members uh, are using a fully different set of metrics to evaluate and understand their risks, 
or this very long and complex disclosure is how this board and management team are evaluating their own risks for their own business. I don't think either of those are a very acceptable outcome. So I would have a broad set of templates, not imposed by the government on these firms, but socialized. This is the kind of thing we're thinking about, to try to protect your competitive position, but at the same time make sure that investors and regulators can see, at least from an order of ranking, where you stand. So what kind of information I think is lacking and might be useful? I don't think investors, based on contemporaneous disclosure, can readily understand how much capital is there that can offset real losses. Capital is defined very broadly. Some capital, which counts in many complex capital ratios, include things like deferred tax assets. Now, it's an asset. If the company makes a lot of money, it's going to be worth a lot. But if the company doesn't, it won't. And I don't think that capital is broken out in a simple, easy to understand piece so that investors can say that's real capital that could offset real losses today. And that other capital, well, that might make the regulators happy. It's not going to make me happy. So I don't think the capital is sufficiently delineated. It's not obvious to me that the liquidity is sufficiently delineated either. What if your liquidity is subject to runs? What if your liquidity? is reliable and persistent, and even if the world gets dark, can we as investors think we'll be there? Some firms, to your point, do a better job here. I would say perhaps all firms are doing a better job now, and the Federal Reserve deserves some credit in the third stress test of trying to get this information and make it public. But overall, I would say the description of assets and liabilities might be in these statements with equal amounts information content and obfuscation, and that's not acceptable. If these institutions weren't effectively or perceived to be effectively backed by the government, I don't think I'd care that much. If these institutions weren't critical to the real economy, I don't think I'd care that much. But given what we've been through, I think we regulators cannot take this burden by ourselves. I am worried that when we've given up on these other pillars, that regulators have overpromised and might well underdeliver. Because if regulators are held to the standard that they're going to make sure bad things never happen again, we're going to fail. And for an institution like the Federal Reserve, the most important asset that's on, uh, that we own is nowhere on our own $2.9 trillion balance sheet. It's the institutional credibility that came to us from our predecessors. If there were an accounting entry for it, it might be called goodwill. And if we're perceived to have failed the next go around in regulatory in policing these firms, I don't think that will just be a regulatory matter. I think that'll be a matter that goes to the efficacy, the strength, and the conduct of the Federal Reserve in everything we do. So those are risks that I think we should not be taking. We shouldn't be over-promising and under-delivering. And the burden on these firms is to provide information that is clear, understandable, and transparent that doesn't breach any confidentiality strikes me as well worth the price of that. Perhaps to close, um, we, um, we might release the assumption that we can write our reforms without reference to the political system. So we've been doing the economy now. Perhaps we could talk about the political economy. Um, what we saw, at least from my perspective, in part during the crisis, was a enormous political push away from mark-to-market -market accounting, which provided some of the transparency uh, that you were concerned about. The politics of it were, as at least as I watched from a distance, and certainly you were closer, that there was a larger if the uh, if the accountants, if the accounting standard boards didn't back off, uh, the Congress, Congress would push it back. So the question I have is the following. Given that we can make, I think it's a fair assumption that which, wh whichever party wins the presidency, they will have an uncooperative Congress. What are the first two or three things that president can do that won't require congressional participation, which unless the world changes favorably, he's never going to get. So the, we've, got a, we've, got a, uh, we've got a regulatory reform space that's defined by the executive, 
without Chapter 14 or anything else, we've really got to run through Congress. Right. So these, these, are, these are good questions. So first, so I don't really do politics, but I can just give you my judgment of the, of the political system. I don't know one member of Congress, one person who's running for the Senate, who's going back to their district and saying, vote for me, and I will make sure we can bail out these firms again. I think that most members of Congress genuinely believe that none of these institutions should be too big to fail, and I don't think they consider that a bumper sticker. I think many of the people who voted for this bill genuinely believe that they have now given regulators the authority and the power to make sure this bad stuff doesn't happen. So I was in Washington almost 10 years. I'm not that cynical to think that they actually want to have four or five institutions that they can direct. Maybe, maybe that's, uh, that's somewhere in the air, but I think the overwhelming consensus is this is in some sense uh, antithetical to the American economy to have institutions that are backed by their government. So while the politics in Washington might be polarized, while these candidates might be fighting about all sorts of things to help the economy, I'd be surprised if any of them is championing too big to fail. Um, so what could the, regulator, the regulatory authorities do? In my view, prior to Dodd-Frank, we regulators had lots of power. We at the Federal Reserve, many of our fellow regulators had plenty of budgets to spend plenty of time and money focusing on what we thought were the real risks. I think this is a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, was there some new grant of authority in Dodd-Frank? Sure there was. Is there much new grant of authority that regulators, if they were focused on, couldn't have achieved had this bill never become law? You bet. So I don't think we need to have a fundamental, um, I don't think this is about what powers Congress will give to regulators. I think we need to have a team of regulators across agencies and that the new, uh, what Dodd-Frank calls the Financial Stability Oversight Council. This is the new regulator that shall sit atop the old regulators to make sure the old regulators do a better job. Well, that makes some sense, I suppose, until you look at the membership of the new Financial Stability Oversight Council. It's the old regulators. So what should be motivating reform? So I have very simple ideas of what makes for good regulation. You heard one of them, a broad remit. Here's the second. You need one throat to choke. You need clear accountability and responsibility in one place. So if bad things happen, you know who to blame. Well, we've taken that accountability and responsibility, which was reasonably diffuse, and we've made it impossibly diffuse. So instead of creating a clear set of accountability, we've made it ambiguous. In the name of trying to rationalize our number of regulators, we now have more of everything. So it doesn't strike me that's the right way forward. Um, I think the regulatory community needs to come to the view which I don't think they have by and large, that market discipline is something worth saving. That capital standards needs to be real old fashioned capital. And they've had plenty of power before Dodd-Frank to come to that view, they have plenty of power now. And so I do think that is fixable. Um, one example of your mark to market accounting. So from a regulator's perspective, mark to market accounting is really nice and easy. You see what market prices are, you look at the bank's balance sheet, and you see if they're broadly playing with market prices. So I must say I came to the Federal Reserve with an instinct towards mark to market for ease, for understanding, and to fight against the gaming that inevitably applies. And so it's still a preference, but I would say um, if you are a community bank, if you're a small regional bank, and you're in the old-fashioned business of banking where you take deposits and you make loans to homeowners and to small business people, and you really do know your customers, the, the argument that those bankers make has done some to convince me that if we were to subject their balance sheets to market prices every day, we might eradicate the kind of community banking and regional banking that we need. So how do I reconcile these? If you are a big institution and you are participating in markets, then you shouldn't game mark to market by moving it from one account to another account when it suits you. And so mark to market accounting should govern the overwhelming uh, majority of your balance sheet 
uh, for your financial institution because that's the only way we can be sure and investors can be sure that your balance sheet is what it deserves to be. If you're a small, privately held uh, community bank or even one that's gone public and you're in a traditional lending business, we need to make sure and investors need to make sure that you are abiding by good and proper and rigorous accounting, that you're taking reserves as necessary. But I would say it strikes me uh, as perhaps a step too far that you've got to treat your balance sheet the way Goldman Sachs treats theirs. Not an easy or satisfactory or perfectly clean answer, but one I think the regulatory community can well adopt, adapt with. Um, we had a long tradition of regulating community banks and of having some community banks succeed and others fail. And when they fail, the FDIC would show up on a Friday, close them down over the weekend, and it wouldn't be easy or fun or pleasant for anybody. But the global financial system wasn't put at risk. When it comes to these largest financial institutions, um, they are spending taxpayer money if they're backed by taxpayers. The consequences to broader markets and the economy are real. And so it strikes me a tougher, more exacting standard from the accountants is called for. And if that somehow gives a modest advantage to traditional banks that are in communities across the country, that would not even begin to offset the expectation by depositors, by market participants, and by the rest of the world that when those little banks close down, there's no one in Washington that seems overly troubled about it. But when the big guys have troubles, it seems as though we have to go into another special weekend. I don't think we're giving much of a favor to the small banks. And if the accounting treatment they were subjected to, so long as rigorously applied, were applied to them, I wouldn't lose any sleep over that. Hey, guys, thank you very much for having me.